Good afternoon, everyone. We'll settle now. And we'll begin with a new branch of machine learning and deep learning, which is called generative modeling. And I say new branch, you'll see that there's a new category within machine learning. And as we're dealing with deep learning, these are deep generative models, okay? So we begin a path of few lessons together. I will be the instructor, and um, you'll see that this is a bit different than the modeling you've done so far, seeing what neural nets are and how to build classifiers and regressions. This is a change of pattern. You'll see what I mean right now. I am Santi Pascual, and I'm doing my PhD here, uh, concretely in deep generative models for speech processing and generation in many tasks, enhancement, voice conversion, text-to-speech synthesis, and so on. So um, I'll begin showing you the outline of uh, situating us on where are we. So what is this new path we're beginning? This is the what's in here and then the introduction to what generative models are, taxonomy of what types of generative models we have, depending on what do we want to model. You'll see what we model, and we can do it different ways. So that's the taxonomy, which ways can we do it so. And variational autoencoders is the today's topic. So today's type of generative model, okay? You'll see that we have uh, in the schedule of the course, yeah, we'll have, let me go directly here, um, you have the today is the lecture for variational autoencoders, and in two weeks, because we have some conferences stuff, we have to travel, so we break it momentaneously to continue generative models on 19th, we will see GANs and likelihood models. So these three types of models, variational autoencoders, GANs, and likelihood models, okay? And in the fourth day, I will do practical lesson, because as this is a new branch, it is programmed with different concepts, we will see a bit of practice on how to make generative models with deep learning, practically. So where are we? What is this? Um, we are basically going to make a radical shift from something called discriminative modeling to generative modeling, okay? Which I will define in the introduction right now. But keep in mind, is this a type of neural network? No. You've seen so far what is the neuron, the MLP, convolutional nets, recurrent nets you will see next week, I think. So um, this is not a type of, of neural network. This is something you can build with neural networks, okay? But it is machine learning concept like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning is a different type of taxonomy class of machine learning. So you can build with supervised, unsupervised or reinforcement these communitive approaches, or you can build generative approaches, okay? We are now going into generative models. And this is very fun, because with these we can basically make uh, computers paint, sing, write, generate contents, okay? So this is where generative word comes from, to generate stuff. So um, we'll begin introducing this shift itself. So you're used to this so far. I will assume zero knowledge on what generative models are, okay? To build bottom up, of course. So from very basics, you know discriminative models, this is what you've seen so far is, for example, with the MNIST data, multi-class classifier, having some input image, for example, handwritten two, and having some upper probability, so some categories saying that digit is number two. But do we care what, what generated the image? No. We're just asking our model. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay, no worries. So um, we're basically asking the network to give us some answer, some probability of an outcome of this being, for example, two given some input. So it will, last time I opened the door. Say it already, let's go see. Okay. So, um, bona idea. Um, we're asking it to compress some input information, yeah, and convert it into some outcome, some response, okay? Regardless of how the input data looks like, so regardless of whether it is 100 in digit or not. We give it some input data and we ask for it for a clear decision in the output, okay? But how is the data? We don't care. This is this commutative model. Just give me some response probability of number two, for example, given some input data. So we're modeling a conditional probability of y given x. This is a discriminative model. Now let's make a shift. What can we do as well with machine learning models when we have data, okay? Regardless of whether we have labels or not. In this case, maybe we have a data set of images and audio or text, okay? Just data, points, samples. 
xn, okay, inside our data set x. What we can do is we can make the model describe yeah, the distribution of those samples. What do I mean? We know that those are images, for example. Uh, how do images look like images? Because pixels are distributed with some values that make the image look like a dog or a landscape or something like that, yes? So it has some probability distribution in the end of the day, yeah? Each sample from the data set, xn, comes sampled from this distribution from the real world, which is unknown and very complex and high dimensional, yeah? An image of just 100 by 100 pixels is already a huge amount of dimensions if we enroll the pixels and the number of channels, yes? So, but that point was emitted from a probability distribution that we don't know, it's just from nature. But we would like our model to know that, that probability distribution. What do I mean? Such that we can get our model to predict something and it will look like an image in the real world, okay? In this case, it can be images, audio, books. So, simply speaking, oh, we can also have labels, okay? It's just to show you that this, this is not related to unsupervised or supervised. This is not about not having labels and only X data. We can have labels, like knowing that this history or sci-fi or thriller book. But what we do is we model the joint probability distribution. When we sample from this data, we'll have some X text from Y category, okay? So we model things jointly, but we care about the process that generated the data and we mimic it with our model. So every time our model makes a prediction, we get something similar to the real data from the data set, okay? It's basically imitating what we're giving to it to train, yeah? If we train it with images of docs, we should get docs in our output, okay? If we give it a phonemes, we should get an a phoneme. And we'll get now a very, very key concept of what generative models are, yeah? If we have some, p some data, Green data points, in this case, very simple, 1D data points, that follow a Gaussian distribution. So I generated those points realistically. I mean, I went to the NumPy function to generate random points from Gaussian distribution, and they make this cloud condense here. And my model I, is trained with weights and biases like neural network. I'm not saying anything about topologies or inputs. I just say that the outputs from it is... Who took the, the, the bin outside? So, um, I just know that the outputs should follow this blue curve, okay? So, the Gaussian curve, yeah? So that when I have my, my model predicting something, it will get out of the blue curve following the distribution of the green points, okay? But this is a key concept because I'm generating points from the blue curve, which is not training data. So, I am generating... <coughs> I'm generating novel content, okay? Every time I sample an image, model samples, it's not taking training samples, it's generating new data. So if I have some network or model, whatever generative model, trained with images of dogs, I will get a new dog that was not in the training set. Some made up new dog because it learned the distribution of pixels to look like dogs and I get an image that looks like a dog, okay? Novel contents, not memorization, key concept, generative models, if they memorize, they're not a generative model, okay? You need some stochastic components, some noise that makes every prediction different, okay? No two predictions have to be the same. This would be memorization, okay? Key concept, generative models follow this rule. And, as I mentioned, samples can either be images which we enroll and we have like thousands of dimensions or waveform samples or whatever, okay? Nowadays, with deep networks and the amount of data we have and computation, things are growing so largely that we can model crazy things, like full waveforms speaking, like WaveNet to Google, or HD images, or even bigger things. So we will cover the key concept of how do we generate data today, yeah? And we'll talk about the state of the art generative models, deep generative models, which will be mainly three types, as I said. Today we focus on variational autoencoders, but more importantly, why do we need generative models? We can, we can model very complex and high dimensional distributions, which is very helpful because we don't know the dependency. So if we had to make the model ourselves, modeling the probability distribution and conditioning between pixels in an image, this would be a crazy task, okay? Um, 
So we may give the data to the network and it can handle to learn the conditionings and the probabilities joined ones to generate images. Okay, so it learns from data, it has the capacity in computational resources, so we can generate novel realistic samples. What can we do with it? Well, for simulation environments, for example, machine can learn from possible futures that we're not giving to it. A generative model is generating them because they are plausible. They follow the real distribution of possible futures. This would be in the reinforcement learning uh, framework. Then in the case of supervised learning for, for classifiers, for example, you can make data augmentation by generating new images of dogs that you don't have if you know that you have to classify types of dogs. But a generative model knows about dogs, okay? So you introduce some new noisy samples to make data augmentation. And even more tasks like doing unsupervised learning, which I will not cover because this is so huge possible number of paths you can follow out of generative models. But more importantly is why now? Why there's now a generative revolution with deep learning? It's because we have data and computational power, okay? And new ideas come up and we can practically implement them. So generative models are really exploding right now. Okay, so you'll see many, many, many papers and works working especially with GANs. They are very trendy. You'll see them next day. But this is a very key concept to do, the future of building what's called uh, intuition or um, common sense for machines. Let them learn from the data, build a model of the world by themselves, and then you take advantage of that doing transfer learning to some specific tasks and so on. Okay, this is about filling the blanks in data. Or you can also edit, edit things and fill the blanks on your data, like for example, Photoshop and things like this, because the generative model knows how images look like. So it suggests you what to edit and fill the blanks and stuff. So you can do many things with generative models nowadays. And even more applications are appearing. Just to mention a few is about imaging painting, which is basically repairing all the images. You don't know what's in the damaged parts, but if a generative model knows the whole distribution of the pixels, how this image would look more like an image, a clean image, it can regenerate a clean version of it. It knows a plausible version of it, okay, from reality. Uh, speech enhancement about regenerating speech, synthesis like Alexa and these devices that speak to you nowadays, image generation, and image super resolution when you decimate too much the image and you recover back, they're pixelated. These models can learn how to make new details that don't exist. They're just making them up, okay? These fine grain details did not exist in this version. They were lost when the, it was too much, to compress too much. You recover them by making up new, detail, new details, not exactly the original ones, okay? We're talking about generative models, so it generates a plausible version of the reality, but not exactly the same. So this image is not the original one. It's a new one, but it looks like the first one because it follows the right distribution. But these details in the hat are probably different because here they were blurry. You had to reconstruct them plausibly, okay? It's like a painter repairing a paint. It's not the original one, but it looks like similar to the original one and plausible. So now the taxonomy. I said uh, these generative models are about uh, modeling probability density functions or probability distributions. Density functions is in the continuous world, which we don't deal with. We're in computers, so probability distributions actually, uh, in the discrete world. Uh, but we will use the name interchangeably, okay? Just PDF, probability density function. Um, don't get mad at me, you're very into math. So um, we can model this PDF either explicitly or implicitly, okay? And inside the explicit model, we can do it approximately or with a tractable density. So basically we have three classes that we will explore here, which are explicit modeling. We know the last function, we will derivate it. We know exactly what's the objective of our model to look like a distribution that we more or less know, okay? We more or less know, we, we're based on some distribution shape and we can build the loss function on top of that. You'll see what I mean with variation or encoders because this is the first class we'll see, which is approximate density. We know some shape that we want to model approximately looking like the real shape. And then we'll see the second day, next day, we'll see implicit modeling, which is generative adversarial networks. We don't know a loss function here. We will make a network learn a loss function for us, which is a very clever mirror trick, I call it, okay? You don't know exactly the same objective, but you know some, let's say, um, let's say you know 
an auxiliary task of another network that will learn to basically uh, the real distribution based on some auxiliary task and saying whether data looks like coming from the real distribution or not. So this is called implicit modeling, but you don't know which distribution it is. It's just a network learning if your distribution is realistic or not. Okay? And you just have to build a classifier, very easy. With the instabilities this imposes, you will see. And then tractable density, which are pixel CNN and flow-based models. This, this topic, the flow-based models, is new this year, not last year we didn't include it, because now it is like becoming uh, practical, so we can implement these things, okay? And generative models are now truly built over the normalizing flows theory. This is built upon something called normalizing flows, very state-of-the-art as well. So the three things, this approximate ones, tractable densities, implicit models, these are the very state of the art on what Google and Amazon and Facebook and all these things use, okay? To generate images, to make speech, to write text, translate, whatever. So, let's focus on the variational autoencoders. You've seen so far what autoencoders are themselves, right? We just focus here, let's say, if you're confused on what network am I using, just imagine the regular fully connected network, okay? I have some vector in the input and vector in the output and I want to reconstruct it, but imposing some bottleneck, yeah? Some reduced dimensionality in the middle. You've seen this in the non-annotated learning or something like that lecture from Xavi. So, you know that we encode some data, we reconstruct it, but this bottleneck is imposing some compression, yeah, that makes our our network not to learn just the identity but to learn a useful compression in our C bottleneck so the code C is the code yeah so uh, just this already we could say it regenerates data yeah it, from X it goes to X hat it's not a perfect reconstruction it's just the version of X with some blurs and some distortion yeah so is this a generative model would you say this is a if I have a code yeah, I, I have an image of a cat. I store the code of the cat. This is trained already, okay, the weight. I get C, my code, and I reconstruct a cat. Is this a generative model? Can anybody know? Why not? Because the output is a copy of the input. Exactly, because this memorization. It's not a novel content. There's no stochasticity, it's purely deterministic. I have the weights, I have my image, it goes to a deterministic code, and I reconstruct it. Okay, it's not the same version. There's an inherent error in my reconstruction, of course. But still, when I use the code again, I'll get the same image. And again, and again, and again. Every inference is the same. This is not generative. This is memorization. Yeah, and we Nona doesn't like it. Whenever we Nona doesn't like it, we don't like it. And whenever she does like, we do like. So, um, it just memorizes. It's not good. But, what if we restrict the shape of that latent space, so of the codes, yeah, such that we know, for example, that we're projecting the image into some features that follow a Gaussian distribution of certain dimensionality, let's say. We can sample from a, a Gaussian distribution. We just go to NumPy or Python library and say, give me a random normal vector of dimension, whatever. And from that, yeah, we know that those features that resemble Gaussian distribution give us a plausible reconstruction of the image. If we enforce the shape here, yeah, we already build a generative model by saying, okay, I encode data and I make this decoder yeah, go from some codes following the random distribution from something resembling the original data. What do we need the encoder for? We need it to make sense of the whole reconstruction path of going from some complex feature space, so the real space, pixel space, to some high level abstraction space, okay, and go back the path. So, jointly, they learn to encode and decode very complex things into very simplistic things, which we can sample. So, we are reducing the task of saying, I don't know how to draw cats pixel by pixel. I mean, I would make just a random image, yeah? By sampling random uniform distribution of pixels, but I can sample perfectly from normal distribution. If the network, with the mappings it makes, projections and stuff, can convert Gaussian noise into the proper distribution of pixels, so it's translating one distribution into another by a nonlinear mapping, then the job is done. I'm very simplifying the very complex thing into a very simple thing I can deal with. I can just sample this, and this means this image. I sample again, it means another image. Every time I have a different sample because this is a random generator. Yeah? So basically, 
this is the concept of reducing the very complex into a very simple complex version. And then look for a direct pixel relationship in this Z. I want to give you an analogy of what Z could mean in real life. What if I tell you, uh, draw me a landscape with green grass and a high mountain and some blue sky and an eagle flying. Then you will draw your own version of it. But you know the elements I've been telling you. Blue sky, green grass, possibly on the floor, you know, glasses on the floor. Then some eagle with some color, whatever, I don't care. But I've given you high level abstraction and you paint your version of it. So these high level features I'm telling you and your conversion is basically the generative process. Yeah? Some high level things, some description, some final result. But the result depends on how you map it. Okay? And every time it can be randomly. You can draw different eagles and different skies and whatever. So these are high level representation and the real data. So basically we can sample Z and generate new X data. This is good. This is now a generative model. But we need to know how to train this, yeah, and which are the restrictions to basically know how to map this here and recover a plausible version of it. Okay? It's not just about training some reconstruction laws and that's it. We have to impose this shape. We will see how now. And this is what variational inference is about. So from order encoders, where we had some deterministic codes, we want to variational ones. We introduce the variational keyword, which means having some stochasticity restricting the shape of the latent space. And variational name comes from Bayesian theory. Variational inference, this is called, okay? Variational inference is about finding <coughs> some function, deterministic function, yeah? That when you forward some random data, it gives you the shape of a distribution you know. And you basically optimize your function such that your output looks like the distribution you know. This is a, a, a sort of technique, variational inference, by which you can find optimum function that resembles your real data out of some prior forwarded to the deterministic function. But in the end, this is, this is called probabilistic graph, okay? This representation. This means we can sample n times from some prior z following random Gaussian noise, and we'll get some random variable x, yeah? Out of some parameters, fixed parameters, network parameters. Now we begin talking about neural networks, okay? It's just neural networks. We leave machine learning apart, it's just deep learning. So this will be weights and biases, and these are used to make a deterministic function projecting z with these parameters to axes which are stochastic because the source is stochastic although the function is deterministic. And we can sample n times having n different results, yeah? And how do we train the model? How do we make f, yeah, matching that the projection looks like real data? We basically base theory on uh, maximum likelihood estimation, yeah, such that the probability density of x, yeah, will estimate this p of x given some z latent variable. We want this. This is our objective: having some good mapping between z and x's, yeah, with some prior z. So this is basically the Bayesian calculation, yeah. Um, this is basically a picture of showing how from a very simple thing we can go to a very complex thing and we require neural networks because they are the most powerful nonlinear mappers currently in machine learning. Currently, I mean, there are no deep trees or deep SVMs or anything like that yet. Maybe they come, we don't know. But we have neural networks trained end-to-end -end so far very effectively. So we use this with this idea, making something simple into a very complex thing. So, now, the maximum likelihood estimation. To solve it, basically, we'd like to know, I will do it like this because I can do it, yes. So we'd like to know this p of x given z, this is the decoder thing, so that goes from the latent representation into the complex x's, yeah, the images themselves or whatever. And we have some prior z, yeah, some prior distribution that we know, yeah. So, we introduce basically this new probability distribution, p of z of x, as a key piece to our model. Do we want all p of z to be injected into the model? No. We just want to model the z's that resemble the subspace of x's. Okay? So, the thing is, we'll basically sample values from z space that are likely to produce x. So, we will consider working with this p of z given x's, making our model be aware that this is the z subspace from the Gaussian thing that lead to our good x results. But the thing is, we don't know this, this quantity here. We don't know it. 
it's unknown, this conditioning. We don't know how Z and X are conditioned, okay? X is a space apart from Z. Z we will choose. You will see how we connect these things. But first we introduce this component as a possible cable in between the both things. So it will try to connect Z and X, which we don't know how they condition each other. We don't know how from those high-level abstract concepts we go to raw pixels, okay? So, and, and we don't know how to build these neighborhoods in the set space such that they mean they have correlations in the pixel space and stuff. So we don't know how to make this, but we will introduce an auxiliary function, auxiliary probability density function, which is Q of Z given X. And this is the thing we will deal with. Why? Because we will be generating this with another mapper. So we will have two components here. One will learn to map real data into high-level concepts, building that subspace of high-level concepts. And then we will build a counterpart, P of X given Z, which will decode high-level concepts into real data. Okay, very, very complex distribution. The thing is, this looks already like an encoder going from X to Z, giving us some output distribution Q of Z given X, okay? This encoder, we inject x's and we get z, and we have this distribution, yeah? It has to be similar to p of z given x, but this already, this operation looks like a neural net encoder, yeah? And this, the p of x's given z, is the reverse way, it looks like a decoder. So we begin shaping up both things that we require, p of x's given z and p of z, q of z given x's, sorry, as an encoder as an, a decoder. Yes, we have two components now, and we need to interconnect them, but interconnect them cleverly. So building some connection into what we have to optimize such that actually Q of Z given X looks like P of Z given X, and how the reconstruction looks plausible given some random Z. Let's connect these things. First, I said I have Q of Z given X, the output of the encoder, and I want it to look like P of Z given X, yeah, of those Z samples, that will basically lead to X's in the output. So I just compute KL divergence, which is the distribution distance measure. Uh, bit, well, it's more or less a distance, it's non-symmetric, but anyway, it's a calculation of how two distributions look similar to each other. And basically it follows this formulation. I'm not going into this, this information theory background, but the thing is uh, easily to follow. We will basically make this KL divergence, making similar cues to P's. We're pushing the distribution from the output of our encoder into P of Z given X, whatever it is. We don't know yet. We don't know what P of Z given X is, but we make this restriction already. And this gives us this expectation of the log of, of the distribution we output and the log of the real distribution we don't, <coughs> we don't know. So, we apply some base rule, and we develop, and this is a lot of equations, okay? But we're just basically developing that we injected the base thing, we expand it, we basically get log of P of X now out of the expectation because it does not depend on Z, it's an expectation over Z space, so outside, and then basically we move it here, yeah? We have still the KL, now minus log P of X, this is what we want our model, to basically output p of x's, yeah? So this already, we have this term inside the equation, equals the KL, no, not the KL actually, the expectation with these differences among these quantities. The thing is, we play a bit more with the equations by swapping signs, and then we get that log p of x minus the KL we had, we imposed, this is the imposing thing on our encoder, towards the real distribution, whatever it is, we have log P of X minus this KL that has to remain the restriction, equals in the end to the expectation of log P of X given Z, this is the output of our decoder. So if you expand the equations basically out of the first restriction, you get that this expectation of log P of X given Z, this is the reconstruction loss, minus some KL divergence between what? Between our encoder output distribution and the prior distribution. So now, things very simple, now one line, okay? Out of the development that I understand, this is cluttering and stuff, you can check it out and it will make sense, just some minus and some divisions and stuff, you get to this equation. Out of just this restriction, because you know that you have some encoder, it has to look like that subset of X's that go from the real data, yeah, that resemble 
the real data, we extract some z's that are plausible to be linked to this data. So out of this restriction, we get this whole equation. What does it mean? Let's dissect the equation, because this is the equation we have to implement as a cost function. We impose that, and it gives us this result. That means, to model the log likelihood of our data, that we introduce with the base rule, basically, to model it, we have some permanent error term that we don't know. We don't know, it's just a fixed quantity because we will not be able to make a perfect reconstruction between our network output, which has some limitations and some errors in the optimization and whatever, and the real distribution. So this exists and is non-negative. So we already have some upper bound in the terms of how much we can uh, reconstruct okay, in code. Okay? This is some upper bound that's getting our some likelihood that we live on the way. But let's keep going. This equals to reconstruction loss, like in a regular autoencoder. This is the same as a regular autoencoder reconstruction loss. In the case of making images with real pixel values, mean square error. In the case of MNIS with binary outputs, binary cross entropy error, things like this. This is that loss. Yeah? The reconstruction, expectation of the reconstruction loss, basically, the encoder, out, decoder, the decoder output minus a KL restriction term that came out of the base rule, which is basically telling us we need to regularize the output of our network such that it looks like our prior distribution. So what are we doing here? This is the encoder output. And we are making it fall over the surface of the prior distribution we choose. In this case, it can be a Gaussian and it will be a Gaussian. But whatever it is, the prior distribution, as long as we know how to sample it, Let's say it is uniform, or Gaussian, or whatever, but we know perfectly how to sample these things. We impose it here. We will make the output of our encoder very restricted to fall over that distribution. Okay? This is what this term is imposing. So, in the end of the day, our loss in the end will be reconstruction loss minus a regularization term. And this is the variational autoencoder loss function. Okay? We have to get our likelihood with some error that we have because of network parameter restrictions that we don't know. It's mixed. We will make, basically optimize it as much as possible to get reconstruction loss minus this regularization term. It equals this. So this is our loss function. Okay? The likelihood we can get is this. And how do we implement it? Because now this is the equations. Now let's see the picture because things now fall by their weight. Um, first things first, though, um, I said we will choose a Gaussian distribution, right? We choose something we know very well, because we know how to implement this, I said, mean square or binary cross entropy. Okay, let's say, okay, but what is this term? KL between two distributions, right? So I know this distribution as a Gaussian, but what about this one? It's some random point, so I get some Z point out of my encoder that follows some distribution, but I don't have it parameterized. So what do I optimize, right? How do I compute the distance between two densities if I don't have a parameterized version of this? If I just have one random point of it, yeah? So what I do is I introduce two Gaussian distributions. The first one is a prior, yeah? It will be a normal distribution, for example. But the one I'm predicting is rather than going into Z samples directly, my network will predict a mean and a standard, so covariance values, okay? Such that from excess, I will learn some mean of the Gaussian distribution, and some standard deviations of a Gaussian distribution, and I will put them into a normal distribution. I will get a sample out of it, yeah? I can be, I, I'm able to sample from them, and now I can compute the distance between these two distributions. I have them parameterized very well, and more importantly, I have a closed form for it. I know the KEL divergence between two Gaussian distributions. So it's very helpful to just predict mean and variance yeah, and assume those are the parameters of my Gaussian distribution with the other one being 0, 1 and then having some close solution. So now, the last component was having reconstruction loss, which we knew, mean square or binary cross entropy normally, and the regularization term becomes minus all this thing. Now we have a closed equation. This thing is the prediction of the network, this thing is also a prediction of the network, and this thing is also a prediction of the network. So everything fits. It's just getting those numbers, putting them into this equation, and that's it. Okay, so that we can now build 
the full auto variation autoencoder thing. Being it having some training data, we have some random images from the training data, yeah. Then this is encoded, and we predict mean in standard deviations, as I said, yeah. Those basically let us assume we have this normal distribution with those predicted parameters, and we can compute the KL divergence between the prediction and the prior. Yeah. This will basically make the encoder predict means and standard deviations that are closer and closer to the prior distribution, basically. So we are restricting that our encoder knows that image has to be, has. So we need to extract some features from the image that lay over a Gaussian distribution. Yeah. And then we get the z-vectors, we sample from this distribution, and this z-vector goes into the decoder, yeah? And we get some reconstruction image. It has some error because we, we want the original image reconstructed, so this is the, the reconstruction loss. So we are reconstructing here whatever came out of the decoder with respect to the ground truth as the normal autoencoder, but we actually add this regularization term to make these things look like a Gaussian distribution, yeah? And this Gaussian distribution has to be as similar as possible to the normal one. It will not be, of course, fully like that, but this is what we expect to happen, to lay over that distribution. We will see why, because this is what unleashes the generative model. Yeah? This is basically meaning I will be able to take away the encoder once everything is trained, and I will sample just from the prior distribution. Why? Assuming that my decoder can regenerate plausible samples resembling reality. Why? Because I made my encoder to make sense that X space falls into some Z values that follow more or less, or as possible, as much as possible, as the surface of a normal distribution. Yeah. So if I sample from that distribution, I can go back to X space, okay, by means of the reconstruction and the variational inference methodology tells me that my approximation will make both being able to project Z and recover it back with some quantified error, okay, with some lower bound. It is called. This is also called elbow, elbow, it's error, I don't know what, I said no, error lower bound optimization, yeah, that's it, elbow. So uh, the lower bound is basically that term there, the red term. It's something we cannot get to zero, okay? Because our network is not completely following P of Z given X, we cannot completely reconstruct the same thing. But we will have a plausible version of things. But Wait, how do I train this end-to-end? -end? Because neural networks are about working with a training algorithm called... How is it called? It's not that I'm stuck. I just want you to tell me what's the algorithm to train neural networks. Come on. Backpropagation, okay. What do we need for backpropagation to compute? Gradients. And gradients have to flow back all the way through differentiable functions. Is this differentiable? No. This is not differentiable. We cannot just sample random point. That's not differentiable. It's just generating a stochastic point. It's not a differentiable function. So what would happen here is gradients will be cut at that point. So encoder cannot be trained with this setup. I'm spoiling it. I'm sorry. The thing is that it was all beautiful and it fit up to some lower bound. But the thing is we cannot train this. But we can make a workaround of this by making the sampling process differential with a very simple trick. And remember this, because this is a key point of variational autoencoders. And this can give you further ideas to work with deep learning when you find these kind of problems of non-differentiable ways and stuff. We will make this sampling from that mean and covariance a workaround by just sampling from it from, uh, from the normal distribution, sorry, with zero mean and variance one. And this epsilon sample will be just multiplied by a covariance and summed up with the mean. So we're basically scaling and translating the original sample and gradients will flow through the differentiable operations, product and summation. That's it. So now we can train this thing. Now things fit. And this is called reparametrization trick. Okay, without this paper about bias would never have been done. So it's important, it's important because otherwise you cannot lay over the neural net 
framework. Okay, and you cannot train things. Now we can train an end-to-end -end system that gives us some latent representation and plausible reconstructions out of it and will be a generative model. Yeah. That is optimized up to some point because we know it from a closed theory with a very plausible loss function. Now, how can we generate samples out of this model, as I've said, if I have it trained already? I trained images, now I just get rid of them, yeah, the training images. And how can we generate things from this model? I said it already. Is anyone able to tell me how do I generate new things now that I have my model trained? No? Yeah? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So I just get rid of the encoder, I don't care about it anymore, let's say, and I just sample from the normal distribution. Every time I infer something from the normal distribution, that gives me a different image. Hopefully it, give, it, it looks like a cat, okay? The better the prior distribution also, of course, the more powerful the representation my variation order encoder can be. So, normalizing flows were made, you will see what they are in the last day, were made to make powerful priors for variation order encoders, but they end up being a new powerful generative model outside of the variation auto encoder framework. Okay, you'll see what they are. But that means we can build here GMS or Gaussian mixture models, or even discrete spaces with something co called vector quantized variation auto encoder that also exists by DeepMind. One year ago, I think it was made. These things are like very day to day evolving. So maybe tomorrow there's a new VI, okay? But all of, all of them lay over the same theory, okay? the variational inference mix with deep learning. But the thing is, we already have now a first generative model, and we, of course, don't use memorization. We can generate from that samples. We can improve it by changing the prior distribution, by having a more complex network that makes better nonlinear mapping. Yeah. The better the network, of course, the better the Q of Z given X. So we need powerful models and enough training data to fill the blanks over our prior distribution. What if I just have 10 images? What sort of distribution do I have to take from it? Maybe some key concepts and that's it. But if you have enough data, you can cover a whole spectrum of possibilities of what images look like. You can project them over a very big surface yeah, of Z point over the Gaussian distribution. So now, if I fill that surface called the manifold, that's many, and Chavi talked about manifolds already. This is projecting a manifold. In this case, it's a latent known manifold because you have the shape on your hands. You know it's prior, it's a Gaussian. So now you know the shape of the manifold and that's a big advantage. And this is why values were made, to know the shape of that manifold. What can you do? You can walk around that manifold. You can encode something, change some attributes and decode it. And you'll get different results. All of them looking a plausible representation of original X with modified attributes yeah, that resemble the, set, the X space, but with a new attribute. Let's say I want to walk around the digit space. Okay, So I have the first column. This will be the latent manifold over MNIST training. Each column will be walking around the area of each number. It's MNIST number, 0, 1, 2, up to 9, yeah? And you'll see variations of when I'm walking through that manifold, you see they vary. Each latent code from the Gaussian surface, I'm, it's continuous, I'm moving around it, interpolating values, it gives me some different gestures and different effects of those numbers. And even some of them didn't exist in the training set, they're just interpolations of reality. Okay, but they look plausible because they follow the distribution of the digits that were generated in the training set. But all these images, most of them should not be in the, I mean, not most of them, they resemble like 90 something percent of the training set, but these are not basically training set copies, that's what I mean, okay? And you basically modify the attributes and generate novel numbers that don't exist. Yeah. Sometimes even nine looks like seven, or zero, you see, this is where maybe you're getting from one neighborhood to the other one, between numbers. Because some attributes from nine resemble seven, it's tall, yeah, it has this sort of traces, and it's rounded as well, so it looks like zero sometimes, yeah, depending on the size of the tail. So you can see this continuous distribution of your complex data into Zs. And when we get rid of the encoder and we just walk around Z, you get this as a resynthesis of reality. Yeah, this is a generative behavior. Also, we can do that with more complex things, 
like faces, which is what nowadays we're using this most for. Generate faces, generate speech, generate text, so and so on. So with faces, it happens the same. You train this thing with faces to reconstruct faces in the decoder output. And you basically walk around and you find that all of them have some common attributes. It's centered over the nose, the eyes, whatever. But it changes tone of skin, color of hair, uh, gender, whatever. Yeah? It's just about walking over the manifold. Manifold has a factorized version of some high-level attributes of our data. Yeah? Yeah. So to finalize this thing, I have some code. I just want to say it's very simplistic to implement this thing over something called PyTorch. I think you, you, all you work with Keras and TensorFlow. Well, I think no, I, I know it's Keras and TensorFlow. But the thing is something called PyTorch, this is what I used. Um, is not, not better or worse, it's just a, diff a decision uh, for some commodities, whatever, about experience. Using this, you change from one framework to the other one. So this framework, for example, has a very simplistic model option. This is already the variation autoencoder, and this is the loss function. With these two components, you already have the via implemented. Because you saw like these equations and this stuff, but it's not that complicated, okay? It's just about nowadays, with these marvelous frameworks, few lines of code, and you have a complete variation of encoder. This one, concretely, is the one that goes from m these dimensions, you see it's an enrolled image of 28 by 28 pixels, 784, to the same output size, with some bottleneck in the middle. These are fully connected layers, yeah? So three fully connected layers in the encoder and two fully connected layers in the decoder. And this is already the MNIST encoder that can generate this manifold you've seen here. Okay? You have the reference if you want to check this thing. It's just about running it, and you'll see it yourself, the example in the demo. And next chapter already, I'm finishing it here, will be about the marvelous guns that fill up the world nowadays. I just want to tell you, to show you, apart from the meme, because this is very into the gun community. I don't know why we make up funny names with guns and lots of gun titles and stuff. But the thing is, they are powerful, to be fair, and they do crazy things with look, which look amazing, and they generate HD images and very good audio text, whatever. So the thing is, we will see this very known generative model fo that, that follow this trend of popularity. So this is the amount of papers that have been appearing since the very first one, which was in 2014. This was the gun proposal by Goodfellow. No one could apply them because they were unstable, whatever, outside of MNIS data set. But then deep convolutional GAN was made to generate first images in 2015. And then 2016 with NIBS in Barcelona, it's a very famous conference for machine learning. Things began exploding. We have a first work on GANs here in the very tail, in the beginning of, no, here in 2017. And now things are just crazy. I mean, <laughs> loads of papers every day are about GANs doing or more stable training or high resolution generation or mixing different modalities or many things because they can do so and we will see how the very basic idea of GANs. So we will go over this paper here and the deep convolutional one and see some applications in detail here, okay? But you see this keeps growing. So this is a very popular version of generative models nowadays. So any questions? This is it for today. First class on gener deep generative models. <laughs> it's deep. Don't forget this. There are other generative models. Classic machine learning should never be forgotten. But, you know, deep learning is just this marketing brand now. But it's very powerful. But anyway, so this is the deep generative model part. <laughs> Any question? Just ask whatever. I understand this is like first, maybe, I don't know how many of you knew about generative, I mean, I knew some of you knew about generative models, but this can be very novel and radically different. And you'll see how it even evolves, especially with normalizing flows that have a hard mathematical background. But we will simplify them and just talk about intuitions and stuff. Okay, that's it? Okay, so we're good to go. Now have some rest because Javi will come now, okay, in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>